Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you today. I, I feel like I'm at home. I grew up in Eastland. If you're familiar, it's just down the road, not too far. In fact, I was talking to my parents yesterday, and uh, they were headed to Louisiana, so we kind of crossed paths uh, on our coming and going. And my dad said, now, are you sure you want to drive at night? It's like, Dad, I'm 41. <laughs> He said, but it, there's traffic and it's a lot of ways. Dad, I'm 41. <laughs> I went to Utah this summer by myself and D.C. and, you know, changed planes. And I said, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, but thanks, Dad, for you know, uh, worrying about me. They should never stop being a parent, right? Uh, ever since Dr. Page has uh, emailed me in the beginning of October, uh, I've been looking forward to being here with you today, and my presentation being behind me is let's keep turning around. So, um, so I'm very uh, excited to be here. I was so thrilled when she emailed me. I was like, "Ooh, an award ceremony! I love that." Uh, I even had a little uh, countdown clock, <laughs> kind of like getting ready for New Year's. And I was so excited, and so the other day I was like, "Ooh, three days, or two days." And, my, so I told my students, I was like, look, look. And uh, I've enjoyed all my speaking events and my workshops, but there's nothing really more thrilling than being in a, an event that honors and celebrates teachers. Uh, especially after I was reading some of your bios and uh, learning all about what you do, I, could, I really couldn't wait to be here and just bask in your greatness. So congratulations. However, um, I do know that I'm all that stands between you and lunch. <laughs> and not only that, not only is it just lunch, but it's a lunch you don't have to scarf down <laughs> in under 30 minutes while multitasking, perhaps at the coffee machine that you know, you're kicking and trying to get it to work or chasing down a student to get their work, whatever it is that you do in your lunch time. So, you know, I started thinking about this. And I'm not sure what's more difficult, trying to talk while people are eating or knowing that they don't get to eat till you're done. So I've done both of those. And then when I found out that I had an hour to talk, I was like, I don't talk for an hour at school. Like, straight, you know. It's like, that hour, that's kind of a long time. And then I really kind of started worrying. I was like, does she realize what bad students teachers are? <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> See, I saw you not. We were sitting at a workshop, and we're you know, like, we would totally not accept that from our students. We're, we're just kind of mad about that. But it's because we don't get together very often, so we enjoy being with each other and visiting. Uh, I thought about having uh, some brain breaks every 15 minutes or so, like I do with my students, but just to, you know, get the blood flowing. But I won't insult your ability to stay focused. But if you need to stand up and stretch while I'm talking, then please go right ahead. Don't bother me. Uh, we do have the best of the best in here, so I'm sure we'll be fine. But uh, someone give me a signal if I stop or start rambling. Just uh, tell me I'm running out of time. As I thought about what I wanted to say today, I was reminded, first of all, of really the need for more opportunities to recognize teachers and the amazing work that's going on in schools all over the country. You know, teaching is one of those behind the scenes jobs that people don't really know what we really do. If, you know, they've seen movies. <laughs> about this is what it really looks like stand and deliver dangerous minds you know dead poet society like I look like that. that that's not how it goes in my room uh, so they have kind of this unrealistic expectation of what goes on but there is amazing work going on all over the country however the media and the public are really quick to point out all the ways that we're failing and they're really quick to jump on those horror stories and the things we really wish uh, were not going on. You rarely hear about all the successes, and yet there's so much greatness happening every day. So here are a few people I think are pretty great. These are some people I work with. Uh, the one over here, that's uh, Monica Washington. She's the 2014 Texas Teacher of the Year. And uh, I just want to share some of their greatness as well, I'll bring them with me wherever I go in my thoughts. If more people really realize what takes place in education every day, I think more teachers might receive a trophy or a medal or certificate 
or at least a shout out on Twitter or something. So I want you to take a second to breathe it all in. I hope that this will be something that you'll remember, especially on those days when it all seems to be falling apart. Like the day I had this week. Or the one I had last week. Well, and my whole first three years of teaching. <laughs> There's some things they just don't prepare you for in college, as well as they prepare us. All the courses that we take, and curriculum, and lesson plannings, and the laws, and all the guidelines, and yet somehow, there's some things you're just not ready for. You see, I've not always been the award-winning teacher of the year that you see before you today. Nope. In fact, sometimes <coughs> I'm the uh, horrible, awful, no good, very bad teacher who's pretty sure she should quit. And you know, you might expect that of a first-year teacher or maybe even a third-year teacher, that there's, you know, some bumps in the road. But, uh, you know, going into teaching, I, I didn't know it would be like that. Uh, I was ready. I was set. I was going to be the teacher who changed the world and made a difference and all my students would love me and adore me and it would all be perfect. And I just, I just didn't know exactly what I was getting myself into. Then I taught my first week. <laughs> Not only did I fail, it was an epic fail. And I called my mom, crying. Ooh, I need to quit. She's like, no, no, no. You'll be fine. It's only been a week. The next day, I called again. Mom! <laughs> Give it time. She goes, tomorrow's a new day. So every time I call her, tomorrow's a new day. She kept telling me that until I finally maybe got the hang of it occasionally. And 20 years later, I still uh, have to now pass by this. It's really big in my hallway as you're entering the building. <laughs> and I look at it and go, oh. In fact, they put it up over Christmas break last year. They didn't tell us it was going to be. It's big. I mean, you've never seen yourself in great big. You're like, ooh, that's a school picture, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, so I was walking in over Christmas break one day, and the lights are off. You know, I'm going into the building, and I'm, walk I'm walking up the ramp, and I go, oh, because there I was on the, like, eye level. And it was kind of, it was a little bit unnerving. I'm very proud of it. Yet, uh, I'm a little nervous, too. Uh, it's still there. I, I keep hoping thinking they're going to like, take it down because my year is up and all that. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of nervous because I'm a little concerned people will find out I'm really not so great. I mean, it says, you know, real big there, teacher of the year, and I'm like, and, or maybe perhaps they kind of already know I'm not that great, and other teachers are passing by, and they're going, <laughs> you, you laugh because you know what I'm saying. And, uh, and then there's you no know, parents who come in and out of our building, and I'm afraid they're walking by and go, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Especially that parent I had last week in the conference who's a little, you know, a little perturbed up, uh, you know, their teachers, and they're, they're just a little bit shaking their heads, and you're worried that they're going like, to take a picture and put it on Facebook and go, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> Facebook, I'd say, social media. And uh, even after another 20 years, there's still days that I think, perhaps I chose the wrong profession. And if you haven't had one of those days, well, bless you, but get ready. It might be lurking around the corner. As I talk with teachers, I realize that, you know, we're really kind of hard on ourselves. We don't expect perfection from our students, but we sure do expect it from ourselves. Whatever you think perfection looks like. It usually looks like that other teacher, you know, down the hall, and I'm like, I wish I could be like that. Or it looks like those, you know, movies that you see on TV. I want to be that person. You know, oh, sorry, teacher. But let me clear it up for you. That teacher isn't perfect either. He or she probably thinks that there's someone else they want to be more like. And I love this quote. You know, don't let someone else make you feel like, you need to be a better teacher. 
be who you are as a teacher. They're probably thinking that they need to be like someone else. Let me save you the trouble of thinking that this honor today means something other than what it is. It does not mean you have to be perfect and free from future mistakes, which is kind of what I was thinking with my award. It does not mean there's more pressure on you to be a perfect teacher for every student, because there's no such thing as a perfect teacher, or even the perfect way of doing things, despite what the media tells us. Teachers are as unique as the students we work with, so you be you. And one thing I've learned is that when I just let all that go, and just do what I need to do for my students, then things fall into place. But you know, if it were that easy, there wouldn't be teachers leaving the profession. In fact, we hear more and more that there's more and more teachers leaving the profession than ever before. And not only that, there's fewer who are entering the profession. There's a teacher shortage, not just in Texas, but nationwide. And I have friends in Canada and the United Kingdom, and they're facing the same situation. So why are we seeing this? And why are there so many articles about teacher burnout? What can we do when the daily grind has got us down? And it seems like we're not getting through some of them. And there's yet another mandate, another curriculum upheaval, staffing change has thrown us for a loop. How do we stick with it? That statistic is a little scary. In the next few years, 50% of teachers are leaving, especially when you know there's not that many in the profession. So how do we stick with it when they throw things like this at us? Oh, all that curriculum planning you did, that wonderful document that you've produced that has all the your plans and all of your unit designs, I need you to toss that. And by Friday, come up with something new. <laughs> We've all been there. So how do we stick with it? Here are just some simple practical tips that I have to remind myself of, even after 20 years, that I hope will help you stick with it too. First of all, I have a sense of humor. I'm the first to laugh at myself. You know, I wasn't so good at this my first few years. I thought I had to be serious. I'm you know, talking things and it's commanding of the class. Especially because I taught high school my first year, and I looked like them. In fact, I got yelled at by the principal because I didn't have my hall pass. <laughs> oh, wait, but I'm a teacher. So I thought I had to, you know, act mature and be serious. So I wasn't so good at the sense of humor part. I was afraid my students wouldn't respect me, or they would take advantage of humor, like it's a weakness. I'm pretty sure that um, those first few years were miserable for my students. Uh, in fact, I apologized to numerous uh, students from those few years. Uh, I was in Sunday school class one day, and in walks this kid. I looked at my husband and said, that kid looks familiar. Oh, he was in my class my first year. And I went up to him and I said, Kenny, I'm so sorry. <laughs> at that, that first year, he's like, it's OK. <laughs> We survived. <laughs> so it probably was as bad as I thought. But I finally found that laughter really is the best medicine. <laughs> because you're all getting a meeting. You're all getting new curriculum. You're all getting 10 more students. We have to be willing to laugh. Laughter can ease a grumpy mood in your students, in yourself, in your coworkers. It temporarily lets our kids forget their troubles. It can smooth tensions in a meeting. It can lift the veil off a closed off student. Every year, I train my students to recognize when I'm trying to be funny. The other sixth graders. Because you know, sometimes they don't catch it. It goes over their head or whatever. Sometimes they weren't paying attention. They missed my joke. So what I've trained them to do is I pause, I wait, I give them a look. And they realize they're supposed to laugh. <laughs> so we get a, then we get a good laugh out of the fact that I was trying to be funny and really wasn't at all. And they're good sports about it. One evening uh, this year, I opened my email and found this. Oh, that was me. Sorry. This was crazy hair day at school. So the kids uh, love my Dr. Seuss look there. 
The one evening I uh, got this email from a student, if you can't see that in the back, it says, uh, can we start a sloth appreciation group on our Google Classroom? He loves sloths. In fact, he talks about sloths very often. He's like, hmm, sloth appreciation. I'm sure we have time for that. I sent him this back. <laughs> that is uh, the Gandalf sloth. <laughs> so the sloth is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. So I said, I appreciate your sloth appreciation. But, uh, maybe we can have a sloth appreciation day sometime in the near future. So you just have to kind of go with the flow, go along with what the kids are doing. We laugh. We laugh often. And I let them laugh at me. We laugh at what a terrible artist I am when I'm drawing illustrations on the board. They're like, what is that? So I you know, tell them what it is because they can't tell from my drawings. We laugh when I stumble over words because I get so excited about something that I just stumble through it and I talk too fast. They laugh at my lack of rhythm when we do a just dance, brain break. We do lots of dancing. You know, this life is too short not to spend time laughing. And some of these kids really don't have very much laughter at home. Second, to stick with it, have a support network. A group of people that you can go to, not just to vent, although sometimes we need to do that too, but to bounce around ideas. Don't forget about teachers in other grades and subjects as well. These are uh, some teachers I went to a conference with, and uh, none of us teach together. We're not even in the same building. We have a kindergarten teacher and a second grade teacher and a third grade teacher, and we all end up going to a conference together. And it was neat to listen to them talk about what they do and where the kids start by the time when I get them as sixth graders. And to have that um, different perspective and to look at things another way. Find people that you want to share ideas with, not just the ones that your department mandates or your district expects you to meet with. Um, you kind of look outside the box of uh, the other people that have great ideas that can share with you. Join professional organizations like ASCD. Uh, there's the Discovery Education Network. Uh, there's uh, ones for your subject, like National Science Teachers Association. So if you're not part of some organization like that, I encourage you to get involved and get connected. Um, you'll be amazed what you'll learn from these people who are all over the state and country. Uh, sometimes we get so busy and caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff that we forget that there's a wealth of resources uh, and the teachers who are doing amazing things. But keep in mind that we've never taught so long that there's not something great to be learned. Uh, some of my favorite teachers at school are the ones who've been there 20, 30 years and they still are excited about learning and they still look to others and see what they can learn from them and they're not closed off from new ideas. They're willing to change and grow along with their students. Sometimes a fresh perspective is all we need to get us and get our students back on track. Along those same lines, be sure to surround yourself with people who lift you up and who share your enthusiasm. These are some of my people. This uh, in the center is Shanna Peoples. She's the National Teacher of the Year. She's from Texas also, and she's the same year um, as I am. And um, she's traveling all over the country and internationally. She's been in the Middle East. She's, been, she's going to China and Peru this year. And uh, she is a wealth of information for me and a source of great inspiration. So find those people uh, outside of your school also that you can turn to and get ideas from. You know, I've been saddened by stories I've heard this past year. Uh, I've talked to teachers. I've met them you know, from all over the country. And some of them just really feel overwhelmed and like there's nowhere to turn. Sometimes you can't find these people where you are. If you're in a building or a district or a place where you feel like you can't share ideas or there's no one else who, who wants to uh, collaborate, then check out five of your district. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to leave where you are. Just reach out to others. There's amazing things on Twitter and Facebook pages and all kinds of social media that uh, give you options and, and people that you can talk to and glean ideas from. So if you can't find them where you are, uh, reach out and find them elsewhere. 
or be that person for someone else. Sometimes all it takes is one person to turn things around in a school. Maybe there's people around you who also feel like they've lost their way. Reach out to them. Sometimes they don't realize that they're kind of stuck in a rut. Let them know that they're not in this alone. If you don't have enough support, you can call me. You always have a cheerleader out in East Texas. So if you uh, need some more support, find the people who their enthusiasm is like yours. It's contagious. The third thing I recommend is to take, take cues from your students. I find when my students are at their worst is when I'm not doing something I need to be doing or I need to be doing something else, something I'm not doing. Sometimes we just need to take a break. We participate in global play day on Wednesday and play board games and cards and just had some time just to sit around and enjoy each other's company and just take a break. They, I could tell they, knew they were getting stressed, their behavior was getting worse. I said, guys, let's just, let's just take a break. On February 22nd, we're going to take part in the global read aloud and we're going to kind of get back to our roots and enjoy some picture books and the children's books. I have some kids who never had parents who read to them at home when they were little. So we're going to take some time and just enjoy read, enjoy some good books. We also start class every day with what I call our dailies. We have Motivation Monday, we have Trivia Tuesdays, World News Wednesdays, Throwback Thursdays, and Famous Person or Famous Landmark Fridays. And I start the class with these. It's usually just two or three minutes um, to show them either something in the real world, maybe a connection to what we're learning, uh, sometimes it's part of the world that they will never get to see. I have kids who've never been out of Bloomdale. We even live next, you know, not just, just down the road from Tyler. But some of them have never even been to Tyler. So we start the class with these to kind of give them another perspective to think about. Uh, here's one of our uh, Motivation Mondays. So uh, I'll play this quick video for you. Uh, on Mondays, I try to show them a video of something uh, to inspire them. Uh, sometimes it's of kids their age or just someone who is motivational and um, someone to kind of give them an idea of things that they can achieve, things maybe they didn't realize that they were capable of. And this is one of our Motivation Mondays that my kids really like in the Olivet Middle School. Um, I just get these off of YouTube and just show them the uh, quick little clip. Gives you hope, doesn't it, for our future? That there's kids like those are middle school kids who did that for him. And so I show my kids things like this, and that's you know not very academic, but what a moment for them to see how kids are doing great things all over the world, and they really enjoy those. In fact, when we don't have school on Mondays when there's a holiday or something, they come on Tuesday. They're like, Miss Cruz, where's our motivation Monday? Well, it's Tuesday. Can you show us one anyway? I had uh, kids this summer who emailed me. Can you send me some motivation Mondays? I need some inspiration. Now, my, I have to say, my girls were a little distracted because those boys were cute. <laughs> so they, had, they were like, you know. But they got the message besides that. It's important that we really take time to listen to our students and get to know them. The time we spend building relationships is never wasted. You wouldn't think that we would need a reminder to build relationships. Most teachers are, are really pretty good at that. But sometimes I find myself later in the year and I realize, have we really like had a conversation? Or have we, all we've been doing is academics and lessons and activities and work. Have I taken the time to really sit and talk to my kids today? It can be easily overlooked. When I told my uh, classes that I would be out today, now some of them chewed, but um, <laughs> Most of them just wanted to know where I was going. They're always interested in uh, what's going on. And upon hearing that I would be giving a speech, one of my girls, she asked if I would include her in it. <laughs> They're sixth graders. Uh, Miss Cruz, would you please talk about me in your speech? Tell them how great I am, and how fun, and how I like to talk. And I said, sure. So here she is. <laughs> Got an arrow pointing to her and everything. She'll be very pleased that I did that. 
She's uh, having lunch with me in my classroom, some of her friends, two of those girls are 15 stickers on my leadership chart that I have in my classroom. And so I set the table and had some candles and flowers and brought the little, you know, sack lunches in and we enjoyed that time together. That was, that was much better than uh, me just walking down my lunch by myself or in the lounge. And it's funny because a couple of days later, the girls came in the classroom and they walked by the table where we sat and they hugged it. <laughs> and they said, oh, the memories we've made. <laughs> Sixth graders. So clearly that was important to them. All they really want to know is that we are connecting with them and that that connection goes beyond academics. They want to know that they hear more about the score on a test or their grade at the end of the six weeks. And with the demands of making sure that we're covering all the standards and they're learning what they need to learn, it can be easy to forget that they're just kids. Even the high schoolers are just kids. <laughs> and I think about that as I have a junior in high school of my own and the decisions that she's having to make. And we were talking about colleges and what she wants to be when she grows up. And I see she kind of gets that panic stress look. And I realize, like, she still has to ask permission for everything that she does before she leaves the house and when she's at school and has to have a home path and all those things in life. And I'm asking her to make a decision about going off and being on her own for four years. It's like one day they're kids, and the next day they have to be adults. It's a little scary. And so they get a little stressed about that. It's something that we need to remember. Another thing that's important is to be an advocate for our profession and for our students. It's our duty and responsibility to change education from within. If we don't like the state of affairs, we have 330,000 teachers in the state of Texas. That should be the biggest and loudest voice. The number is pretty impressive as a voting block if you think about in these upcoming elections. If there's things that need to change in education, we could be the ones who change it. Maybe things don't change because we don't speak up. You know, teachers are notorious for just accepting whatever they throw at us. We are adapters by nature. We think, well, I don't really have time to fuss about whatever the new change is. We've really become accustomed to just making it work. Whatever new thing that comes down the line, we just adapt to it. Sometimes we think that if we fuss over it or complain about it, that it makes us look weak or unprofessional or maybe not capable of handling what they've given us. But what we need to remember is that we know our students best. We know what they need. And it's up to us to be a voice for the voiceless. In addition, we need to make sure that new teachers, or even just those new to your school, know what's going on. You know, I'm dismayed at the mistakes I made my first few years, and if there just been someone looking out for me, and, you know, maybe I wouldn't have made all those mistakes. I think the only advice I got my first year was, um, I think you need to smile more. Which was good advice, but there were some other things I really could have worked on, and someone let me know. I've learned over the years that the stronger the school is, the more we all benefit. So we can't just be in our classroom and worry just about what we're doing. We need to remember that we're all in this together. Because individually, we can do great things, and there's much greatness going on, that together we become a force to be reckoned with. Volunteer to be a mentor to new or younger teachers, if you're not one. Or, if your district doesn't have one, start a mentoring program for the new teachers to your district. Remind them that we're all in this together. We're there to give ideas, but we're also there to share the burdens and the joys. Last but not least, take care of yourself. When it all becomes a little overwhelming, remind yourself why you teach. <laughs> Why you know why you started teaching, not why others think you started teaching. <clears throat> Write yourself a letter or a list of all the reasons you became a teacher and what you love about it. I do believe that teaching is my calling. Um, people have asked me that over this past year. So why did you become a teacher? Why do you love it so much? And 
didn't you want to do something else? And really the most often asked question I get is, well, don't you want to be a principal or some other type of administrator or go on and teach college? And it's like, I really kind of like being a teacher. Like, that's not good enough to just be the teacher. I need to go on and do other things. I'm like, I really kind of like being in the classroom. So I think that's what I'll do. And in fact, growing up, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. There really wasn't any, <clears throat> excuse me, there really wasn't anything else I wanted to do. I never changed my major. I never really looked into other options. Um, I had lots of people encouraging me to do other things. Um, in fact, I had people say, you know, you're really smart. Are you sure you want to be a teacher? <laughs> well, I didn't quite know how to take that, but my response was, I think teachers kind of need to be smart. <laughs> I kind of saw that as a, you know, good attribute to have. I think what they meant is they knew that getting into it, we're not going to make the big bucks. You know, we're not going to get all the prestige and the honor that maybe some other professions get. But I think it's the most important job. I keep a box and also have a drawer and a folder and several other things of pictures and things that my students draw and the letters that they send and I print out emails and uh, things that they uh, give to me. And I use those to affirm that I am indeed getting through occasionally, even those days when I feel like I'm not. Sometimes I just retreat to a quiet space and pull all those out and pile them up and, and just read through them on those days when it seems hopeless. This is a picture I look at when I feel myself getting down. It's kind of dark. We were, um, that was our last day of school last year. And, um, I was playing them the song, I Hope You Dance. And they were swaying, even boys swaying and enjoying the moment. And I look up and these three girls are hugging like this, tears just streaming down their face. You see, they built a friendship that year. We had a pretty rough class and there were uh, quite a few kids with some obstacles that we had to overcome. And these girls built such a friendship and it was heartbreaking to see them say goodbye to one of their friends who was moving um, the next day, in fact, back to China. And this is something that we forget. We forget about the kids and their relationships and the importance that it has for them. But we managed to build a family that year and that's something that I take great pride in. And I look at this picture and remind myself when I feel like I've kind of lost my way. I hope you know that our identity, even as a teacher, is not wrapped up in whether one student passes the star or starts reading before kindergarten is over. I know we all want those successes for our students, but it's not always academic. And sometimes academics are not even the first successes. I had a student a few years ago, and he had uh, quite a few emotional needs, and, and really his first success was being able to keep his hands to himself and being able to use proper communication and, with, you know, and interact with his peers. And so we had to tackle those things first. The academics were secondary for him, and those came later. Once we got the other things under control, he had some academic successes as well along with his classmates. We can't be our best for our students if we're not the best for ourselves. So don't lose sight of who you are as a person. Don't let your passions outside of teaching take a back seat. Let students in on your world, what you like to do for fun. When I ask them, you know, would you do this weekend? Or would you do over spring break? They always want to know what I spent time doing, which was usually hanging out with my cats. So then we talk about cat stories, and we always have a dog story or some other kind of story to share. We take some time to relax and breathe, and I have to remind myself of that on the weekends, to not always dig into my backpack and get all my papers out to grade and work on a lesson plan. Sometimes I just need to sit and enjoy my family and life's little moments. That's my family. That's when I was at the airport headed out. And speaking of family, be sure and thank your family. Sometimes they sacrifice as much as we do. So uh, be sure when your families, if they're not here yet, uh, to support them as they support you and allow them to enjoy this moment with you. It's for them as well. Because it takes a very special person to be in the family of an educator. Just ask my family. We have long hours and sometimes some crazy ideas. Like, honey, can you build me a pulley system? Would you stop by the store for some baggies and straws and marshmallows? 
oh, do you still need these tools and, and this tool that's in the garage? My husband just shakes his head, <laughs> whatever you need, dear. This was that, we duct taped our assistant principal to the wall. So, administrators, I've given your teachers some ideas. <laughs> If you haven't done this, we did this as a, they're scared now. We did this as a, as a fundraiser, uh, the K Kids Club that I sponsor. Um, the, uh, there's six grades of student led organization, and the kids brought a dollar. For every dollar they brought, they got a piece of tape. And we taped our assistant principals to the cafeteria wall at lunch. And you can see by the number of pieces of tape how much they participated. It was very exciting. We, we raised lots of money. And our assistant principal was a good sport, and he came off the wall and had still had all the tape stuck to him, and he walked through the school like that and went to every classroom. We're doing it again this year. We're very excited. Yeah, there have been times that my family has called me, and I realize I'm still at school working. They're like, are you coming home? So, oh, yes, yes, yes. Because sometimes I just get, you know, wrapped up in a project, and they remind me, come home. And I was pretty sure that I had permanently and irreparably damaged both my goals with my teacher life until I got to read an article that my daughter wrote for her high school newspaper. Her journalism teacher asked her to write it after I won my award. And she didn't tell me that she was doing all that or that it was going to be online or in the school paper or anything. And I just wanted to share part of it with you just in case maybe you worry too about the time that you devote to your students. So this is just a little bit of what she wrote. She said, consequently, the teaching life has become my life too. I've grown up in the school, spending days of my weekends or summers there, helping grade papers, create presentations, set up for events, getting to school unreasonably early, and staying way past time to leave, and of course, having no choice but to behave in school, since my mother knows it. But I get to see my mother not only as a teacher and a leader at school, but in all other areas of her life. I get to be with her when we're at the grocery store and a student runs up and gives her a big hug and talks to her for a good 15 minutes. And then we see a student from years past working at the checkout who tells her, I know I was a troublemaker in your class, Miss Cruz, but hey, I graduated. Got a scholarship. My life's good, thanks to you. I get to see her legacy carry on through every student who passes through her classroom. I even get to see the things she doesn't see, like how everyone I meet now was in her class at some point or another, and they always have these funny stories to tell about her. I get to see her come home from the store during the summer with some new clothes or shoes because one of her summer school students doesn't have what he needs. I get to listen to her stories about how she's had a breakthrough with a particularly tough student and see how excited she gets about every step in the right direction. I get to see all the fruit of her labor and still get to have her come home and start her other job as my mom. And now she's finally being recognized for the years and years of hard work of course, all I can think about is it's time for her to get the praise she deserves. I can see it in the way her eyes light up when she starts talking about her kids. I can see how much she loves what she does, and that it's more than just a job for her, it's a passion. Now that other people have recognized her many years of labor, my eyes can't help but twinkle when people in passing say how awesome it is for Lindell to have a Texas Teacher of the Year. So I respond, I know, Miss Cruz is my mom. Through the eyes and from the heart of a 16-year-old. Now, mind you, she has no desire to be a teacher whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> She's seen the life. In October of 2014, I had no idea what this past year would hold for me and how my life would end up changing. I do remember going back to school that Monday after the awards, and my students would cheer as I walked in. Of course, they often do. <laughs> you see, that's just how we roll. But one of my sweet students said, Miss Cruz, Miss Cruz, what's next? Will you be teacher of the universe? <laughs> I said, Don't you know? I already am. Where's your trophy? I said, 
me as a trophy when I have you guys. And that's the truth, because our students are the prize. They are the award. They're my reward. Seeing them be successful, seeing their eyes light up when they make a discovery, when the pieces of the puzzle finally fall into place. Sometimes we get to see it. Sometimes we find out about it a little later when we see them as adults, like my little uh, troublemaker. <laughs> I thought that numerous times that year. I was, I was quite certain that I wasn't going to survive that year. He really gave me a run for my money. But it turns out he's now a bodybuilder and a paramedic. And when he found out that I won an award, he sent me a message on Facebook and uh, to let me know how he was doing. He said that he's got his life together. He thanked me for my impact on his life and the lives of others. And oh, how my heart just swelled with pride. They do grow up and turn out okay. And do you know, that's how they feel about you. They're proud of you. Even the junior high student who runs the other way when they see you in Walmart. They're afraid you're going to talk to their parents. Even the kid slumped down in his seat with a wall of anger so high around him you think you're never going to get to him. Like my Tony. He was mad at the world and everyone knew it. He got in trouble everywhere he went, all day long, every day. And yet, day by day, I chipped away at that little wall and worked with him as best I could with what he needed. He was brilliant. Uh, I'm not sure how much academics we covered that year with him. We were chipping away at the anger wall. He used to draw me pictures of cars driving off into the sunset <coughs> because that's what he wanted to be doing rather than be where he was. And at the end of the year, I got this note from him in my yearbook. He said, I loved having you as a teacher. You taught me a lot about life. Not about academics. Not about science and social studies, although we did some of that about life. And if you think about it, that's really what we're preparing them for. Not just the next class, not just the next grade, not just college, although all those things are so important. We're preparing them for life. So you keep planting the seed. Give them roots. And surprisingly, almost miraculously, they will grow in spite of where they might currently be planted. I know it's heartbreaking sometimes to hear the stories of what some of our students struggle with and what's going on in their lives. Sometimes the things we don't see that are underneath. But plant the seeds and they will grow. So I may not be teacher of the universe as my students wanted me to be, but I am proud to be a 19-year teacher. I've been honored to represent and be a spokesperson for our great state, for my district, for my region, and now I'm so proud to be here with you and see you have the chance to be honored for your work with your students. You know how lucky they are to have you. This recognition today doesn't stop here. I hope you know that the honor continues because you're amazing educators. I hope you'll remember this distinction every time you look into your students' faces. Remember it with every lesson you plan and every activity you create. Remember it during cafeteria duty, and while grading senior research papers, and while actively monitoring during the star. <laughs> Never forget the influence you have each day. If we think just about the teachers in this room, the 32 of you being honored today, and let's just say you have 25 students. Now I know some of you have way more than that. So, but just for the simplicity of math, let's just say 32 of you each have 25 students. That's 800 students whose lives are being impacted by the people in this room. And if we multiply that by, say, 30 years of teaching, that's going to be 24,000 student lives impacted by you. And then multiply that by the other great teachers across the state and across the country and across the world. And those lives will be changed because of you. Just imagine what they're going to grow up and be, and how they will take that impact and turn it around and impact their world. So never forget your influence and the importance of what you do every day. 
You are a keeper of the flame. Let me show you this little video. New teacher friend said that to me at one of my lowest points. And I sat there, of course, in my classroom mold, watching that. And I hope you remember that you are the keepers of their flame. I hope this recognition today inspires you to use your voice for our students and for our profession. I hope you continue to seek out ways that you can grow and learn and influence those around you in our state to improve education. And because I know who you are, and I know what you do, and I know what you're capable of. I want to close with a poem. That's the English major in me coming out. So next time you're thinking, I'm just a teacher, or someone says that to you, and you think, who will listen to me? Or you look at a student and you think, I don't know what else to do. I can't be more. I can't do more. I just want you to remember these words and what you mean to so many. Dear teachers, I see you. I see you still working in your class way past dark, taking home papers and bags and books. I see you meeting with teammates for the millionth time to find that one thing to get that student hooked. I see you planning and replanning and changing your plans to meet every learning style, ability, and need. I see you bringing in real world math and a love for books, even for those who struggle to read. I see you coaching and cheering and encouraging each one to go beyond where they thought they could go. I see you serving on one more committee or club because dedicated teachers often don't say no. I see you reading and studying and learning some more, always working to improve what you do I see you staying up late and getting up early and being excited to try something new. But even more than all this, I see you spending your very last dime on supplies and neat things for your class. I see you giving up your free time, what little you had, to help them do more than just pass. I see you wiping noses and covering alleys and writing letters of recommendation. I see you tell them how brilliant or beautiful or strong they are without any wavering doubt or hesitation. I see you fret and stress and worry over whether what you're doing is enough. I see you tear down the walls of those students who are trying their best to be tough. I see you have faith and dream big and be the guide for those students who have not yet found their way. I see you celebrate small victories, yet set standards high, day after day after day. I see you hold in your heart all their hopes and their fears and take their pain on as your own. I see you hug and high five and give pats on the back for students who don't get that at home. I see you make sure they get fed and have a warm coat and love each as though they were your own. I see you be brave and fearless and a protector of all you know they can become. So dear teachers, next time you feel like you're getting nowhere and the weight of their worry fills your heart, know that you're meeting them right in the place that they are. And that's always the best place to start. Pat yourself on the back. Keep on keeping on. Keep loving them big when they feel small. And know that not only do I see you and all that you do, but your students see you too. So stand tall. Congratulations. Thank you for all you do.